And this is his other band that pretty much sounds like a local punk band playing like the most basic punk songs of all time on slightly out of tune instruments, which to be fair is also what the Misfits sounded like, but when they did it, it sounded good. What's up everybody, I'm Finn McKenty. this is the Punk Rock NBA, and welcome back to the second installment of rock and metal side projects that absolutely completely sucked. Or, you know, maybe they didn't. Maybe they were actually great. Because the weird thing is that when really talented people from great bands do a side project or come together to be a super group, more often than not, it actually turns out to be not great. Although that is not always true, like those kind of weird times where the side project ends up being bigger and better than the band that originally spawned it. And so in this video, we will be looking at side projects from bands like Pantera, The Misfits, Sepultura, Fall Fallout Boy, Limp Biscuit, and more to find out did they suck or were they actually great? But first, if you haven't, please subscribe and turn on notifications to make sure that you don't miss any of my videos. But first, I want to thank Atlas VPN for sponsoring this video. If you're not familiar, a VPN is basically like a secure tunnel through the internet that helps protect your data. And if you want a huge discount on Atlas VPN, just click the link in the description below. And why should you use Atlas VPN? Well, for one, it helps you stop ads and malware. It blocks all the malicious links, ads and trackers, and also notifies you when someone is trying to steal your data. It's also a way to get around all those annoying geo restrictions on content that you might've come across. For example, if you wanna watch shows like Top Gear or Rick and Morty on Netflix, well, if you live in the US, you can't, unless you use Atlas VPN. All you need to do is connect to one of their UK servers, refresh Netflix, and boom, it's all there for you. Atlas VPN is also super fast and you can use it on unlimited devices with a single subscription. And best of all, right now, Atlas VPN is offering a huge discount. That that means you can get a three-year subscription for just $1.99 a month with a 30-day money-back guarantee. And time is running out, so if you want to get that deal, just click the link in the description of this video and enjoy. All right, so first up, we have all the various Pantera side projects, which are honestly kind of a mixed bag. The most notable is probably Down, which is Phil Anselmo and Rex from Pantera with members of Crowbar and Corrosion of Conformity coming together to do kind of a sludge, doom, stoner kind of metal thing. which normally I'm not a huge fan of, but when it comes to those kind of riffs, nobody does it better than Crowbar. Phil is obviously one of the best of all time. And I think that Down does this style pretty much as well as anybody ever has, or probably ever will. And they probably did more for the popularity of like sludge stoner kind of metal than really anybody else, other than Black Sabbath, obviously. There is also Super Joint Ritual, which was Phil with members of I Hate God and Hank Williams III doing like sludgy, stoner, southern hardcore kind of stuff. Again, not exactly my kind of thing, but I think they did it really well. And quite a few other Phil related projects, for example, his black metal band Viking Crown and his grindcore band Scour with members of Pig Destroyer. He also did features with Cattle Decapitation and Soylent Green, among many others. And whether you like any of this stuff or not, whether you like Pantera or not, I do think it's really cool how prolific Phil has been and how he's done so much really extreme stuff. I mean, really nothing he's ever been involved with is bad. I would say overall his batting average is extremely high. Unfortunately, I'm not sure that you could say the same of all the other various post Pantera projects. For example, Damage Plan and most notably Hell Yeah, which was Vinnie Paul with Chad Gray from Mudvayne. And I'm not gonna say too much about them out of respect for Vinny, rest in peace, but you know, not great. Let's just say that. Another example of side projects that did not work so well is The Misfits. 
Pretty much everything involving the Misfits other than the Misfits is bad. The most notable example would be Christ the Conqueror, which is pretty much what you would expect from the name. It's a Christian speed metal band started by Jerry and Doyle in 1987, which is pretty much as bad as it sounds like it would be from the name and the way I described it. I'm still kind of confused. Like, I'm not really sure how the song Thunder Thruster is about God, but I don't know. Maybe someone out there can explain it to me because I have questions. There's also Doyle's band Gorgeous Frankenstein, which with all due respect is like bafflingly awful given how many things Doyle has been involved with and like presumably he has functional eardrums. Like this is just objectively terrible. It sounds like the band recorded their music and then like some drunk guy snuck into the studio after hours and like re-recorded his own vocals over the top. Like I'm not even exaggerating. It's really that bad. He wants a woman, oh, he'll kill me, so I... And there's also Dr. Chud's X-Ward. Easily one of the worst band names I've heard in a long time. Sounds like some weird, like, porno shareware game for PCs from the early 90s. And honestly, it's kind of the musical equivalent of that. For those who aren't aware, Dr. Chud is the drummer from the 90s version of The Misfits. And this is his other band that pretty much sounds like a local punk band playing, like, the most basic punk songs of all time on slightly out-of-tune instruments. Which, to be fair, is also what The Misfits it sounded like, but when they did it, it sounded good. So in hindsight, as much as I just generally find him to be kind of cringe, and he himself has put out a lot of music that I would say is not great. And I'm lonely. It's pretty clear in hindsight that Glenn Danzig was by far and away the creative force, like the driving energy behind the Misfits and anything good about them was probably because of him. But on the other hand, we have all the various Sepultura related side projects, which fared much, much better. For example, Max Cavalera did a side project in 1994 called Nail Bomb with Alex Newport from Fudge Tunnel. They only did one album, but it was a pretty cool mix of like punk, metal, and industrial. And also, I don't know if it counts as a side project, I guess kind of, sort of, but Soulfly, which was his band after Sepultura, which I think is really, really underrated, especially their 2004 album Prophecy. The answer is we the warning shot. The revolution you can think is back. This provision is for inspiration. To me, that album is almost like the album that Sepultura should have made, especially considering how just honestly, in my opinion, mediocre all the Sepultura stuff without Max is. And don't get me wrong, everyone in the band is great at what they do, especially Igor, who is one of my favorite metal drummers of all time. He also played in Strife for a little while and was awesome, but I think it really just shows you, again, how important one person was to the band, in this case, Max. And next up, we have a band called The Damned Things, which, as you may remember, was a super group made up of Scott Ian from Anthrax, Joe and Andy from Fall Out Boy, and Andy and Keith from Every Time I Die. And this is kind of an interesting one to me. Like, Every Time I Die and Fall Out Boy are both from the 90s hardcore scene, so that part makes sense to me. What I'm kind of unsure of is how Scott Ian came into the mix. But regardless, I think it actually came out really well. The situation is out of my hands, I'm the crossbow. I'm not generally into like bluesy Southern kind of stuff. That's why I've never been a big fan of Every Time I Die. But I think the damn things did this style really, really well. It's almost like what I wanted Every Time I Die to be. It has that kind of like groovy, bluesy sort of sound, but a lot less noisy and with more like straightforward and I would say just better songwriting. And all in all, I would say that as far as supergroups go, this is one of the better ones. But what is not so great is Big Dumb Face, which is Wes Borland of Limp Biscuits side project with his brother Scott, who released their debut album in 1998, which is, well, let's just say it's very interesting. A bolt of lightning from the sky to fly on. Where there is battle, he will fight a lion. He's never late, he's super great. 
to me, listening to this, it's pretty clear that they were trying to be Mr. Bungle, only to be blunt, they are just not as talented as Mr. Bungle. And I think it also shows why that team of Fred Durst and Wes Borland was so good. Like you listen to what they've done separately and it's not nearly as good as what they did when they were together. And to me, it's pretty clear. Like on the one hand, Fred needs Wes for his just wild creativity and like all the innovative, just off the wall ideas he comes up with. All the stuff that made Limp Biscuit sound so unique and different. For example, like the main riff in Nookie. And on the other hand, Wes needs Fred to kind of keep him in check. Because without that, as we can see from this band, it seems like without that, Wes just kind of goes too far down the rabbit hole of zany, weird music that seems really cool when you're in sixth grade. But once you grow up a little bit and the novelty wears off, you realize actually wasn't great. Still, Big Dumb Face is pretty fun. That first album is at least kind of entertaining. And I do respect them for their willingness to just be weird as fuck and clearly disappoint and alienate all the Limp Bizkit fans that wanted it to sound like significant other part two. But maybe my personal favorite side project or supergroup of all time is Stormtroopers of Death or SOD, which is essentially Anthrax with a different singer. In this case, Billy Milano from the band MOD. And fair warning, this is not exactly politically correct, as you might guess from the title of the album, Speak English or Die. But in my opinion, it is easily one of, if not the best crossover thrash albums ever made. It's like the perfect blend of the precision and just like tight crunchiness of thrash with the aggression and attitude of hardcore and punk. And to me, the big difference is the vocals. Like, I love Anthrax now, but when I was a kid, I really just did not like Joey Belladonna's vocals. I always wondered what they would sound like with more of like a hardcore vocalist, and the answer is this album. And they do have a couple other albums, which I would honestly say you can skip. They're not bad, but they're really just nowhere near as good as Speak English or Die, which is, in my opinion, a timeless classic. I mean, if you like offensive crossover thrash, then it just does not get any better than this album. Which brings us to what I guess you could call the Mike Patton extended universe. His most well-known side project is Mr. Bungle. Although technically he was actually in Mr. Bungle before he was in Faith No More. So Faith No More is technically the side project, but whatever, you get the idea. Mr. Bungle actually started in 1985. Like I said, a couple years before he was in Faith No More, but didn't really kind of become established until afterwards. He used his clout from being in Faith No More to get the band signed to Warner Brothers, which is hilarious that like they were on a major label because they were easily one of the weirdest bands of their era. I remember getting that debut album, I think in 92 and just loving it because it made absolutely no sense. And they had song titles like squeeze me macaroni and my ass is on fire, which is hilarious to a 14 year old like me. And listening to it now, I don't know that it's something I would necessarily choose to put on. It's kind of like very zany and wacky in that early 90s Ren and Stimpy kind of way. But I would say that it does hold up as well as anything in that style really kind of could. Maybe I'm just looking at it through rose colored glasses. Maybe it's actually terrible. I don't know, but I do have kind of a soft spot for it. There's also Phantomas, which was his project with Dave Lombardo of Slayer and Buzz Osborne from the Melvins, which is kind of hard to describe other than just weird, kind of like everything he does, I guess. Very avant-garde, very just all over the place. Again, I wouldn't choose to necessarily listen to it every day just because it's so kind of strange and weird. Not exactly the most accessible stuff, but I do think it's pretty great for what it is. And if you're into experimental music, I'd say it's worth checking out. And lastly, Tomahawk, which is probably the most accessible thing he's ever done. Although with that said, it is still Mike Patton, so accessible for him is still pretty weird. It's him with members of the Jesus Lizard, Melvins, and Helmet. Again, I would say definitely worth checking out. But a vocal whose track record is not quite so strong is Chris Barnes from Cannibal Corpse side
side project Six Feet Under, which became his full-time band in 1995 when he was kicked out of Cannibal Corpse. And you can say what you want about him. Like, he seems like a very strange, genuinely unhinged person that I would never want to be in the same room with. But his vocals in Cannibal Corpse were some of the very best in death metal of the entire decade of the 90s, or arguably of all time. He was incredible. <laughs> Which is why I truly don't understand how he sounds this genuinely awful in Six Feet Under. The body, my dog man, pick up the pieces of my destruction. I mean it, like I seriously am confused. Like, is there nobody who is willing to take him aside in the studio and be like, dude, that was not good. Like, I don't know if you need to drink some tea or, you know, take a nap or what, but like, this is not good. We can't put this on the record. But what's truly incredible is that the vocals may not even be the worst part of Six Feet Under. You gotta watch their video for the song, America the Brutal, which kind of reminds me of like a high school kid who just discovered Noam Chomsky and put this PowerPoint together for speech class, like, totally gonna blow their minds with this one. America, 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 America. Another super group that objectively is probably bad, but I kind of love is Infectious Grooves, which is Mike Muir and Robert Trujillo from Suicidal Tendencies. Robert obviously went on to be in Metallica later with Adam from Excel and Stephen Perkins from Jane's Addiction, all coming together for the purpose of playing funk metal, which was a weirdly popular thing back in the late 80s and early 90s. <laughs> And listening to it now, I gotta say, it is incredibly corny, but I loved it when I was 13. And you have to admit, the musicianship in this band is absolutely nuts. These guys can all just play their fucking asses off. I mean, you look at the lineup, you got Robert Trujillo, who is obviously one of the best bassists ever in metal. Steven Perkins is an incredible drummer. They also had Brooks Wackerman in a later lineup of the band when he was like 16 and he was already better than everybody. I would say he might be the single best punk drummer of all time. He went on to be in Bad Religion. You know him now as the current drummer of Avenge Sevenfold. I mean, you put those people together in one band, the music might not be great, but God damn it, those guys can play. But one thing I've never really understood is when people do a side project that really just kind of doesn't sound that much different from their main band, which is how I feel about a lot of the projects involving Chino from Deftones. For example, Team Sleep. Like, why isn't this song just a Deftones song? <laughs> I really don't understand. Like, I suppose it's a little bit different than Deftones, but I, I don't know, why? His other side project, Crosses, is maybe a little bit more different than Deftones in that it's more like goth and synthy or whatever. But again, I really don't see any reason why these couldn't just be Deftones songs. And last but not least, our final super group is Killer Be Killed. Very bad name, by the way. Which is Greg from Dillinger, Ben from Converge, and Troy from Mastodon. Oh yes, and also Max from Sepultura. Like, how could you go wrong with this lineup? You would think this would be insane, right? Like, you'd expect it to be, like, the most over-the-top, chaotic, like, scronky, noisy, rip-your-face-off, chaotic, metalcore kind of shit, right? You get all those people who have made so much great shit, so much, like, heavy music together in one group, and somehow it ends up being, like, radio-friendly dad rock very puzzling very disappointing but you know if they're happy doing it that is what is most important i guess all right my friends that does it for this video as always let me know what you think in the comments of this video if you haven't checked me out on twitch i'm streaming live twice a week on tuesdays and thursdays from 4 to 7 p.m pacific there's a link to that in the description of this video also i want to thank everyone who supports me on patreon especially those of you who support at the true cult level or above patrons get every podcast a week early i do some giveaways i do some q a's there's also a way to have me review your music or artwork or anything else just join at the ten dollar and up level every month i do a call for submissions all you got to do is drop your work in the comments of that post and then i will review it live on twitch post it on patreon for everyone and that's that so if any of that sounds cool to you there's a link to that in the description of this video and with that i'm gonna sign off for now but i will see you next time